Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena here in beautiful Barabuda. Now, in a couple of days, I believe we're gonna have some weather blow past, so we should probably move to a different anchorage tomorrow to be a bit better protected. But today, I think is a good day for us to head ashore and check out the one and only town here on Barabuda. But to be honest, I don't really know what to expect because from what we heard, Barabuda got hit pretty hard by Hurricane Irma in 2017, and it sounds like they've been struggling a little bit to rebuild. If you're new here, we're Ava and Mess. I spent seven years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Trident Warrior sailboat named Athena. It was an oh glorious sanding extravaganza. We left Denmark and started cruising full time, sailing down Europe's west coast. And then we had our biggest adventure yet, crossing the Atlantic. Now we're sanding and sailing our way around the world. Looking at Navionics, it looks like it's about 2.5 nautical miles from the Anchorage to Codrington, which is the name of the town. And that should be an easy trip for Mr. Speed Demon back there on the dinghy. But there is a sandbar in between us and the town. And although on Navionics it looks like it's no big deal, we have heard rumors of breaking waves. We jumped in the dinghy and tickled the Speed Demon. It was yet another one pull start. So far, we've only had our new outboard for about a month, but it has been nothing short of a game changer for us. Our dinghy, on the other hand, has developed an annoying slow leak. For every day that passes, I get more and more excited about building a carbon fiber foam cord dinghy. Something a little bit bigger with more room for carrying stuff, something that can't develop a leak and something that won't get damaged by UV light. There are two very much homemade markers that look like they indicate a safe place to cross the bar. We did see some breaking waves, but the opening is wide and on a calm day, it's no problem to cross. In town, there is a little fishing port where cruisers are welcome to leave their dinghy. This is also where you can get rid of your garbage as demonstrated here by my lovely wife. Before leaving, we paid 29 EC or 11 US dollars for leaving the dinghy in the harbor and also getting rid of the garbage. We are in Cadrington, which is the capital of Barbuda, and Barbuda was pretty much decimated in 2017 by Hurricane Irma, which was a Category 5 hurricane and recorded as the most powerful hurricane ever in the Atlantic, with wind speeds up to 185 miles an hour. We chose the building here behind Ava for the first shot because it's got obvious signs of damage from the hurricane, but it is important to note that there are plenty of buildings here that are really nice restored. There's a great example right here. Barbuda was affected the most from Hurricane Irma because the eye of the storm hit right on top of the island. It destroyed over 80% of the buildings and the island was declared uninhabitable, causing all of the residents, around 1,600 people, to be evacuated to Antigua. And that was the first time in over 300 years that there was nobody on the island. As you can see, six years after the hurricane, there's still a bit of rebuilding to do. But while we were researching about the hurricane, we came across this really interesting conflict between Barbuda, Antigua, and, wait for it, Robert De Niro. This all goes back a long, long time ago, but we'll get back to that later in this video. But to make a long story short, Barbudans have owned all the land on the island since 1834 when the British emancipated their slaves. The building right behind me is the old government building. Now, this building was not destroyed by Irma. Actually, when the hurricane hit, it was being remodeled, but that was halted due to the hurricane. And I thought that this would be a good location to talk about the conflict because, of course, starts with the government. The Barbudan Land Act of 2007 codifies communal land ownership. It states that Barbudans own all the land. It also states that no land shall be sold, and it entitles Barbudans to three plots of land, one for housing, one for agriculture, and one for business. Despite the act, immediately after the hurricane, Prime Minister Brown, in a closed-door meeting, announced the end of collective land ownership, claiming that private land ownership is the only way that they were going to be able to rebuild Barbuda, saying that collective land ownership scares away foreign investors. Quick side note, this building behind me is a, another historical building, and for many years it was used to hold salt, and then eventually it was used to hold city council meetings until Hurricane Irma took off the roof 
but there are plans to rebuild. Back to the story, because even though Prime Minister Brown was trying to say that the communal land ownership would scare away foreign entities, the act explicitly states that foreigners can lease land in Barbuda, and that relationship was tested with our good old friend Bobby D. A few years ago, the Antiguan Parliament passed special legislation through the act to greenlight a Robert De Niro backed 250 million 391 acre resort here on Barbuda over the wishes of the Barbudan Council. And rightfully, the Barbudans felt like the Prime Minister was using the hurricane to take away their land rights once and for all. As with any complicated relationship, there of course is always two sides of the story, and this really just seems like one source of tension between the two islands, but being here, it does seem hard not to side with what feels like the underdog, the Barbudans. Like I mentioned, we didn't know what to expect when coming to Quadrington. Yes, there are many buildings that haven't been rebuilt, but at the same time, there's a bustling school, which with the sound of kids playing, and the new building for the Babudan Council is under active construction. Personally, I have a bit of a soft spot for animals, and seeing all sorts wandering free on the island brought joy to my heart. That alone made coming here worth it for me. I included that bit at the end because prior to going ashore, we had read some kind of negative comments in Navali, which is an app we use for finding anchorages, stating that there was nothing to do and nothing to see in Codrington. I don't think that's true. And I think if you come here, it's well worth it to head to town and wander around for a bit. After all, not everywhere we go has to be an amusement park with instant gratification. And a visit to Codrington is a fun peek in through a window into what life can be like on a small Caribbean island. And also it's a interesting and very sharp contrast between here and the more popular tourist destination of Antigua. It's two islands, one nation, but very different islands. Every single person we walked past here on the island said good morning to us. And I don't think we've had that experience on any of the other islands. So you could make a case that Barbuda is the most friendly of all the islands, with the small asterisks that we haven't been to all of the islands yet. The next morning we had booked a trip to the largest frigate bird colony in the Western Hemisphere with a local tour guide. We would have loved to have gone on our own, but sadly you're only allowed to enter the bird sanctuary with one of the local guides. We zoomed through the anchorage and raced past the old collapsed hotel at the entrance into the lagoon. From there it was only a couple of nautical miles to the birds. After a few minutes, we saw the first bit of mangrove along the northern coast of the lagoon. And off in the distance, there was a big swirly mess of giant birds. As we got closer and closer, the birds got more and more impressive. By the time we got into the shallow water of the mangrove, we could almost reach out and touch them. On a personal note, I am not an ornithologist, but I like taking photos of birds. Ornithologists tend to be a very special breed of human. I am not that, but I am a photo geek, and birds make for an interesting subject. Speaking of interesting birds, these frigate birds are something straight out of Jurassic Park with their pointed wings and enormous size. The males have giant red sacks they can inflate in the hopes of attracting a mate. If only us human males had a giant inflatable sack like that, I'm sure it'd be much easier to get a girlfriend in high school. Alas, we're stuck with far less impressive means of attracting a mate. Besides the inflatable sack, the frigate birds are interesting because they can't swim or walk. They're stuck either holding onto a branch or flying. And also, Barbudans call these birds man o' war because they like to gang up and bully other birds into giving up their catch. After just a short visit, our time was up. It was time to pack up and head back to Athena, but not before Ava busted out her newest crochet creation, which is, of course, a male frigate bird with a very impressive giant sack. After we got back from our little bird excursion, we moved Athena to a different anchorage. Before we were anchored up here in the low bay right next to the entrance into the lagoon, but we've now moved down here to Princess Diana Beach. We did that because there's some weather that's going to blow past tomorrow. It's nothing super terrifying. They're talking about 26 knots, something like that. But after our somewhat bumpy night at anchor up in Guadeloupe, um, I just feel like any kind of protection we can get from a northerly swell would be really nice. 
I don't know if it gets bumpy up here in the low bay during a northerly swell, but all things being equal, we must be better protected down here in this little corner. While we were on our way here, I was reading some of the different comments on Navali for some of the different anchorages here. And some of them mentioned uh, coral heads that weren't documented on Navionics. And uh, of course, that's something we need to keep an eye out for. But fortunately, we have this camera at the top of the mast. I installed this camera thinking it might be useful for when grabbing an anchor ball or coming into a marina, but it's also proven very useful for spotting underwater things. I remember when I installed this camera at the top of the mast, I got a somewhat negative comment from somebody calling me a maroon saying that it was a useless camera and that it was gonna get covered in salt spray anyways and you would never be able to see anything from the camera. And well, after three years of cruising, I have never ever cleaned the lens on that camera and I don't know what it looks like to you guys on camera, but to the naked eye, the picture is crystal clear. I'm a little bit curious here because what is the etiquette when you show up in an anchorage where there is tons of freaking room? Like for instance here, there is nothing about a mile that way and nothing about a mile that way. We've been anchored here since, uh, well, yesterday and uh, then just about an hour ago or something, this boat right here behind us showed up. I've got a wide angle lens on the camera, so it might look like they're further away, but I'd say they're about a couple of boat lengths from us. One of the things I really like about cruising is the social aspect of it. So it's nice to have neighbors, but I mean, it's also nice to have a little bit of uh, privacy. And as you can hopefully see here behind me, well, there is just tons and tons and absolutely tons of room. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, what is the etiquette? Anywho, we're anchored right around here. These green blobs here are supposed to be coral reefs, I think. It would be really cool if we could go scuba dive on that coral reef later today and check that out. But before we can do that, I need to service our dive compressor. This is a Coltree Icon LSE 100. We picked this up before leaving Europe. So it's a single phase 230 volt dive compressor. We only have about four and a half hours worth of runtime on the compressor so far. And uh, well, it's still very early days, but at least so far we haven't had any issues. While we were in the US, I picked up a few items. We need to service the dive compressor. We have a new filter cartridge here and we have some new compressor oil. And also we have this guy. This is the official snorkel air intake doohickey from Coltree. When we were in Barbados, I uh, made this thing, which is kind of the cruiser's fixed version of the uh, official version. The reason for this air intake doohickey here is so that we can get the air intake for the compressor outside of the boat, especially when we're running the compressor inside of the technical compartment. When I cobbled together my cruiser's fixed version here using some random fittings and a bit of hose from a hardware store, I tried my very best to find spiral reinforced hose because this stuff here, it, it really likes to kink and you don't want that. So that's why I'm swapping out the cruiser's fixed version with the official version. As I mentioned, we're slowly creeping up on five hours worth of runtime and five hours is the breaking in period for this compressor. So that's why we're gonna be replacing the oil today. After today, we replace the oil, I think it's every 50 hours or every year. Yep, as you can see here in the maintenance schedule, the lubrication oil needs to be changed every 50 hours. But those 50 hours will get us about 140, 150 refills. So it's not something you're gonna do very often. Something that needs to be replaced way more frequently is the filter cartridge. And the exact interval depends on temperature. Our version is the 100 liters per minute version. So assuming it's 40 degrees Celsius inside of the technical compartment, we need to replace that filter cartridge every four hours. If on the other hand, you're somewhere where it's 20 degrees Celsius, much more reasonable temperature, then you'll get 10 hours out of your filter cartridge. This is the first time I'm replacing one of these filter cartridges. I believe they have a little indicator on the side to show you how spent they are. So I'm kind of excited to see that. Let's start with the air intake and then dive into the maintenance. After having liberated the compressor from the infestation of fittings related to my cruiser's fix, I threaded on the official suction kit and moved the black filter housing. 
The aforementioned filter cartridge sits inside a beefy cylinder on the other side of the compressor. In my eager to see one of these filters in real life, I made a mistake and opened up the new filter before checking the little indicator on the old one. According to the indicator on the old cartridge, it's still good, but I had already opened the new one, so I decided to swap the cartridges anyways. The compressor only holds a little over half a liter's worth of oil, so an oil change is super quick, although the oil seemed to be in no hurry to drain. With the drain plug back in place, I added half a liter of oil to the compressor without spilling a single drop. Now the manual tells you to run the compressor for a few minutes and then check the oil level. As commanded, so done. Both the dipstick and the side gauge looked spot on. Whew, that is hot and noisy work, but at least now we have two tanks that are topped off. 210 bars of fun coming up. Running the dive compressor is thirsty work in terms of angry pixies or energy consumption. When you first start out and the tank is almost empty, the dive compressor draws around 2000 watts. But then when the tank gets closer to being full, that goes up to somewhere just around 3000 watts. It takes us about 20 minutes to fill one tank, meaning for the two of those, we're looking at somewhere around 1.5 kilowatt hours worth of electricity. The sun is a beaming today. So we should be okay. We should be covered by the solar panels. But yeah, 1.5 kilowatt hours, that is a lot of juice for a small sailboat. Well, a little bit of annoying news. Uh, whoops. <laughs> we uh, had some high winds blow through uh, a couple of days ago and that's churned up a bunch of stuff. So the visibility is pretty horrible actually. So yeah. We're not going to go diving. That was a little bit of a bummer. Yeah, but yeah. we were warned of this from lots of people. Well, yeah, and it makes it makes perfect sense. I just yeah. didn't think about it. But no. at least now the tanks are full. Mm -hmm. um, so when we get to... Turks and Caicos! Yep, we should be ready to do some diving because yeah. we start that journey tomorrow. It's going to involve a couple of jumps to some islands. But mm -hmm. in next, next week's video, if everything goes to plan, then we should... Arrive in Turks and Caicos. Yep. That'd yeah. That'd be awesome. Get some diving in. Yep. Yeah. And on that hopeful note, we'll end this week's video here. And uh, we hope to see all you guys back here aboard us in the next week for some sailing fun. Yep. And uh, yeah, that's going to be the end of this week's video. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See, see you. you.